thanks everybody for coming. I apologize for the uh, late start. Looks like one of the sessions ran over. So um, I'm Ann Bacci. I'm a professor at Rutgers. I'm a board member of Defeat MSA. Um, we'll just keep that short um, and we'll get right into the questions. There were a couple questions um, that were posted in the chat. So I wanted to start with those. They're both actually, I think, directed towards Dr. Kumpati, but um, uh, let's maybe Dr. George or Dr. Lang could answer these. Um, the first one was, what is the difference between um, amphiloxetine and atomoxetine? Edwin, did you want to talk about that? Uh, not really. <laughs> I, I, I use atomoxetine. I'm not all that familiar with amphiloxetine. So. I think they're um, basically drugs in the same theme maybe slightly different potency, but uh, they act uh, in a very uh, similar fashion. Okay, so maybe when Dr. Kumpati comes in, we can see if she has uh, additional information about that. Um, and this other question also relates to orthostatic hypotension. So uh, the person asked, I have occasional orthostatic hypotension that drops of 20 systolic. The past two years, I'm having increase in supine hypertension at night. Do I need to be concerned about long-term heart and kidney effects? Bed is raised, and I stop eating four hours before bed. I can address that one. Um, and it does have some long-term uh, heart and kidney effects. That's why we don't like the blood pressure to run too high for, for very long. And it can be possible to adjust the orthostatic hypotension meds to try and keep them away from the evening hours. But we also sometimes will use a short acting antihypertensive at bedtime. Um, I've used captopril sometimes. Uh, and uh, then you still, if you do that, you have to be very careful about if you need to get out of bed in the night. And ideally you wanna have a bedside commode because you're going to have worse uh, orthostatic drop if you get out, out of bed while you're on an antihypertensive, but it is a way to manage the problem. Um, so there's a question that was dropped into the box here. Due to the complicated treatment of MSA, who should oversee care? Family, doctor, or neurologist? Family, doctor, or neurologist? Uh, I think a neurologist needs to be involved and preferably a neurologist that is comfortable with the complexities of the treatment. And uh, these are very significant problems. Edwin's just uh, mentioning the issue of having to treat orthostatic hypotension with one drug and then worsening of supine hypertension with another drug. And that's something most doctors aren't comfortable with or familiar with. So I think that uh, you need someone that is familiar um, often cardiologists will have considerable expertise in orthostatic hypotension, so that's very reasonable uh, to have them participate in that care, but it, you usually need a team, and I think I made that point in my lecture. Um, many times the general neurologist isn't comfortable or familiar with doing all the things you need to do. If you're lucky enough to be in the care of a clinic that has a, a significant expertise in MSA, that would be the best, but not everybody lives in the necessary proximity, although it's a little easier with um, virtual care, but uh, still um, it's better if you can see the person live some of the time too. I would just yeah. add, it's unlikely the family practitioner would have much experience or expertise, but they obviously are the most accessible. So they need to work very closely with the specialists. And with the, so. Yes, so I, I agree entirely. It has to be a team and there has to be good uh, communication between the physicians. So I had um, come up with some questions of my own after watching the presentations. Um, and it, there aren't gonna be probably clear answers to this, but, um, and this was really for Dr. Lang. How do you decide when a treatment is really no longer working for a patient, uh, for a patient? And once you've reach the point where treatments are not really working. How do you manage, um, manage that with, with patients and their caregivers? That's a challenge. Um, and a lot of patients get on medicine. There may be some suggested benefit. And then there's often the temptation just to leave well enough alone and not change their medicine. But we have to remember 
that all the medication that we use have potential complications. For example, we were talking about orthostatic hypotension, anti-Parkinson drugs very commonly worsening that symptom. So uh, when we are not sure that the patient is benefiting from medication, then I think what we do is a slow titration downward of any medication that we think they may not be benefiting from. Uh, we never stop things abruptly, uh, always a slow tit titration down. And we really give it to the patient and the caregivers to tell us if they think the patient has, is worsening or has worsened as we were lowering the drug, then they just go back to the dose uh, prior to the, the noticeable worsening. And sometimes we end up lowering the dose, but not completely withdrawing the drug. So I think you just have to have a, a very open mind to trying to withdraw drugs if there's a question as to whether they're benefiting the patient or not. Unfortunately, I think the audience understands many of the problems, for example, the Parkinsonism um, does become refractory to treatment. And we have to admit that uh, maybe the patient won't benefit and there isn't a point of continually trying a new dopamine drug, for example, just because the patient hasn't been exposed to one drug or another. I tend not to use dopamine agonists, for example. There has been some literature to suggest that some patients benefit from pramipexol or rapinarol when they didn't respond to levodopa. I think the evidence of that is very small. And uh, so I'd be interested in Edward's comments because I generally don't use dopamine agonists in people who have failed levodopa. I'll always give a trial of amantadine but I generally don't go back to the dopamine drugs. And certainly I don't go from one drug to another to another if the patient has failed. You're Dr. muted. Oh. Unmute. You're muted again. <laughs> <laughs> My, uh... Um, internet connection was unstable and I switched over to a different one <laughs> and played havoc with things. I, I don't use the agonists much. I use them in early Parkinsonism in patients who have a lot of trouble tolerating levodopa at first, um, but always tell them we're going to end up having to come back to levodopa. Um, and I use them in people obviously with restless legs, which can be uh, uh, <clears throat> feature in many of the Parkinsonian diseases, but otherwise they're just uh, too, too much problems with uh, side effects. There are a few questions in the chat. I see someone put a, a comment. I have a question, please, please type your question into the chat and we'll. Yeah. we'll um, so one of the questions says, a diagnosis four years ago, I had a DAT scan which showed decreased dopamine. Is there a time when this test should be repeated to gauge progression? Hi, Katie, do you want to take that? Yes. Uh, yes, the, that scan is uh, not, is uh, just shows us that uh, there is decreased production, decreased projection of dopamine fibers from the uh, area where it's produced to a deeper area in the brain called the striatum. This is uh, a, more prominent in Parkinson's disease, but can be prominent, but, but can be present in other Parkinsonian syndromes like uh, MSA. It cannot be used to differentiate differentiate between those. The way that we utilize that scan now in clinical practice is not such that can uh, measure progression of disease or the degree that you are deficient in dopamine, and it cannot be used in any way. Uh, to to see how fast everybody each one each person is progressing, so and the way we the, the that scans we at least have in Chicago are mostly qualitative, so they're a bit hard to interpret sometimes. So I wouldn't say that there is any need to repeat it. So the quantitative there are some quantitative. That scans that um, can measure more accurately the um, degree of dopamine loss, but those are used only for research, to my knowledge, mostly for research. I'd emphasize to the listeners that uh, 
CAT scans are not necessary to make a diagnosis of Parkinsonism or MSA. And yeah. uh, if your doctor has not ordered a DAT scan but has made a diagnosis, you don't benefit in any way whatsoever by having a DAT scan. We don't have DAT I scans see. in Canada and it hasn't changed our approach to managing MSA or diagnosing MSA at all. Yeah. Not, yeah, I, I totally <laughs> agree. So Dr. Complotti, there are a couple questions that came in before you got on um, that I think uh, probably directed- I'm sorry, I got the, the time zones mixed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question was, what's the major difference between amproloxetine and atomoxetine? Uh, to my knowledge, the amproloxetine is longer acting than atomoxetine. I mean, there's no way to know how much they, they're different in their efficacy because they've never been compared head to head. But uh, amproloxetine is an once a day medication. And usually, atomoxetine usually is used, uh, can be used once a day, but it's uh, a lot of times can, is used twice a day, at least for blood pressure. Okay. And then another question that was earlier, my husband experiences a drop in BP when he goes from standing to sitting. Have you seen this in other patients? Also, he experiences seizure-like episodes sometimes, always when he is seated. Have you seen this? His EEG shows no seizure activity at the time of these episodes. Cardiac monitor showed nothing either. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Usually what we call orthostatic, and that's why it's called orthostatic, is the drop in the blood pressure when somebody is moving from the sitting or laying down position to standing. And uh, where the mechanisms we usually have to maintain the blood pressure are not present. But I've seen some extreme patients who can, can be severely orthostatic, even when they're sitting and can only uh, live their day by, you know, in the reclining position or laying down. And that's part of what we measure in the scale when we do the studies, is like how long can you sit and do certain things or how long can you stand and do, do certain things. So sometimes people go from sitting or laying down to standing and the blood pressure drops and the family, instead of laying them down, they make them sit down and that's not enough. That does not decrease the, does not increase perfusion to the brain sometimes. And you can have a seizure if the blood, if, if the brain doesn't get adequate perfusion after a few minutes of sitting. But it's not because we went from sad standing to sitting. It's probably maybe, I speculate here, maybe the person was sitting, stood up, dropped the blood pressure, and then instead of laying down, they just sat down, was not, which was not adequate. I think if, if people have, uh, quotes, seizures, and actually they are seizures, as Katie's indicated, uh, going from the lying to the sitting position, that would be uh, an indication of quite severe orthostatic hypotension, mm -hmm. and it needs management. Uh, the cause of seizures in MSA is almost always orthostatic hypotension. Seizures are not a typical feature of this degenerative disease at all. And so if you have these kinds of episodes, you need very good monitoring and care. Uh, that's a very dangerous situation if you're having seizures with a drop in the blood pressure simply from going from lying to sitting. So you need to see an expert and have them monitored. Yeah. And they shouldn't be treating it with an anticonvulsant drug. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I but just these people add, end up in the emergency room and get on an anticonvulsant quite often. Yeah. Uh, I was going to add, if you see somebody who seems to be having orthostatic symptoms, but they're occurring at all various times, not clearly in relation to changes in position of going to upright, then you really need to look for cardiac arrhythmias because that can also occur. Yeah, and that's a very good pressure. point. Mm -hmm. Okay, another, another question posted in the chat. What can I do to help with my freezing of gait and tremors? They recently increased carbidopa, levodopa, but it's not helping yet. I have MSA peak. I'm happy to do that if you want. Uh, yeah. uh, as, as we were discussing, unfortunately, 
the Parkinsonian features of MSA may or may not be responsive to the usual anti-Parkinson drugs, and they may be variably responsive. So you may only get partial response. That is a very important challenge to our care of patients with MSA. We are limited because we only have anti-Parkinson drugs. And these are largely, not exclusively, but largely drugs that increase the activity of dopamine or act like dopamine. As Dr. Compaliti mentioned, the degeneration is not only on the dopamine side of the equation, but on the downstream uh, pathways. So you have dopamine. I always use my left hand and my right hand to talk about this when with patients. So here's the dopamine side and it talks to the striatum and in Parkinson's, you lose this side, but you still have this side largely intact. Whereas in MSA, you often lose both components to variable extents. And so increasing the dopamine side may not be sufficient to improve the symptoms. Uh, we do raise the dose. Usually we give people a good trial of at least a gram of levodopa. And sometimes if they seem to be benefiting to lower doses, we'll go beyond a gram. Um, recognizing the potential side effects, including worsening of orthostatic hypotension. Uh, some patients do get benefit from amantadine for freezing. And so I always give patients a trial of amantadine. Physiotherapy, very, very important to uh, help people both with freezing, but also managing the consequences and avoiding falls and things like that. But it's, a, it's an important challenge. So another question, um, I was surprised to hear that knee-high stockings are not effective. They were suggested by every physician we have seen. Can you discuss this further? I'm, I'm pretty sure that every physician uh, recommends uh, uh, up to waist-high uh, stockings. Even the thigh-high stockings don't do too much to, to help push that blood up to perfuse the brain. So what happens when you assume the upright position, you know, there is a pooling of blood in the lower part of the body and the normal people have mechanisms through tightening of blood vessels and uh, muscle tightening, etc., to push the blood up, to create enough pressure against gravity to push that blood up to perfuse the brain. And uh, this, this doesn't happen at the level of the lower leg. So you need to compress even higher. I would say, I mean, as somebody who's tried to wear those stockings myself, I recognize that it's very hard to put them on. It's very hard to take them off to go to the bathroom. And uh, I understand that. So I think that if you cannot do the waist high, maybe you're better off not doing them at all because the benefit you get is, is not that significant. Maybe people should stick to the abdominal binders or, you know, or uh, another thing that helps a lot is that elevating the head of the bed at night, which people don't seem to get, you know, I keep telling my patients and then, you know, they come back and they still haven't done it. I, th I guess that's a little easier these days with those, beds that go up and down. But I, I think that the knee highs are just placebo. Dr. I, would agree. Go ahead. I think the, the thigh highs can give some benefit in patients. Some of them. But so that's there, there were very sure hard that you can well. tolerate the waist high, but the knee highs just aren't going to do it. And you have to be careful with the uh, hospital type beds if you're just folding people in the middle and not really getting the, the feet significantly lower than the heart, then you don't uh, get as much benefit. It's best if you can really do a full reverse Trendelenburg with getting the head of the bed higher than the foot of the bed. Um, uh, my experience, the, the minority of patients tolerate the uh, full length um, anti-embolic stockings. So I think the audience should not feel bad if you 
can't find you tolerate them because very few of my patients thank you dr lang thank you <laughs> and and if you live in a hot climate it's even worse so uh, oh yes I don't feel bad and as edwin uh, has said um having a bent bed is no good you need the head of the bed up so like that not like that and in fact there's a physiologic mechanism it changes the way your blood goes to the kidneys and the way the um the mineralocorticoids, uh, the, the um, response to postural maintenance and, and the, um, the chemicals that occur from the kidneys and altering uh, sodium and water output, uh, that's the mechanism of action largely. And then the other advantage is with the head of the bed up, you tolerate the potential supine hypertension better that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it does both of those things. It, it decreases the effect of supine hypertension and of uh, volume, vascular volume by pin a lot, decreases the getting up to pee and the drop you have at night when you get up to go to the bathroom to pee. Looks so like we have a couple follow-ups on that. Um, one person noted, I need to balance the benefit of abdominal compression for blood pressure with bladder incontinence. Um, I have occasional orthostatic hypotension, but increased uh, BP and supine hypertension. I elevated my bed, stopped eating four hours before bedtime, rarely take mitodrine. BP is in 160s to 170s systolic, 100s diastolic. I take hydralazine at night. Is this MSA or should I see a cardiologist? I mean, can't you know, tell from that <laughs> if it's really MSA, I was going to say, but uh, it, it needs some more juggling of the medications. Go, go ahead, Dr. Compaletti. No, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, it, it's very hard to give a direct answer to this question. You know, that what's happening with MSA patients and the uh, dysautonomia is that you have a roller coaster. You have a lot of lows and you have a lot of highs. And, uh, and you know, usually the highs, the more dangerous highs are at night where the per per person goes to sleep and maybe the hydralazine, which is short acting blood pressure medication to bring the blood pressure down may be appropriate at night. Some people do it. And, uh, uh, but uh, during the day, it's kind of a harder thing to control. My experience is that midodrine compared to Norcera, and that's an causes more uh, hypertension than the Norcera or the Amprelloxetine when I was doing the clinical trials. You know, that's why it's sad that this drug hasn't materialized yet. But, uh, uh, you know, cardiologists, I would caution people, have been geared all their life to react to high blood pressure. MSA patients should be uh, maintained a little bit high, not 200, but 150 is not bad. You need that pressure to maintain perfusion. And uh, I haven't had good luck with, with most cardiologists because they've spent their life trying to lower blood, uh, people's blood pressure. Same thing with salt. You sit in a table with people over 65, nobody's going to put salt in their food. It's very hard to change that. It's so hardwired. But I think, you know, MSA patients, in order to avoid the very deep lows, you have to set the average a little higher. You should be able to tolerate 150s, 160s. And in the end, high blood pressure would hurt you or kill you in years. Low blood pressure can kill you or hurt you right now. A couple announcements or reminders. Um, everyone except myself and, and our three physician speakers uh, should be muted and videos off. If you have questions, you can post them in the chat. Uh, for patients and caregivers, and just want to let you know, um, tomorrow, Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we are going to have a breakout session specifically for patients and caregivers. So we welcome you to join us then. Um, one question that I had is, um, does a patient have to be in advanced stage of disease for alpha-synuclein aggregates to be found in skin biopsies? 
I don't think we know, but I think it's very unlikely that uh, it is only advanced disease. <clears throat> we know, for example, that you can find uh, aggregated alpha-synuclein with the RT quick or the PMCA testing. These are the seeding uh, assays. Uh, you can find those in people who have uh, rapid eye movement behavior disorder in advance of any development of other features uh, that suggest the diagnosis of MSA. So I think that we're going to find that uh, these methods will really, I believe, revolutionize the way we approach the diagnosis in the not too distant future. Um, the work that we're doing with the skin, I'm, I've been very impressed. We've not, we've been able with the brain to show a very different meth, um, behavior of the seeding between Parkinson's disease and MSA. We then moved to the skin and found that the difference in the patterns were not found, but the MSAs were positive like the Parkinson's. And then we combined that with another test called neurofilament light in the um, blood. And we find that MSAs, they have a positive alpha-synuclein in the skin and a high neurofilament light, whereas the Parkinson's have a positive alpha-synuclein in the skin and a low neurofilament light. Now, we've done that in a relatively small number of patients, but patients that are coming on after our, our first pilot are showing the same kinds of results. So we're collecting a lot more data. The hope is that we're going to have blood tests. So I'm we start with the hope that you don't have to do a lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture, you can really reliably find this uh, uh, aggregated alpha-synuclein or the seeding uh, abnormally um, folded alpha-synuclein. We'd like to avoid having to put a lumbar puncture needle in everybody you're making a diagnosis, and a lot of people don't like that idea. So that's why I was very uh, keen on moving to the skin, and in fact, we're finding that's uh, very uh, positive. But I think in the, again, not too distant future, there's a lot of promise in uh, certain blood tests looking for the presence of this abnormal synuclein in uh, what are called uh, exosomes. And the exosomes may, and we may actually find the, you can find these are little um, vesicles that are in your blood that come from your brain. And we have differently derived exosomes. Some exosomes, these little vesicles come from nerve cells, but we're also able to find these exosomes that come from glial cells, supporting cells in the brain. And that's something that's very exciting because if you found it in glial cells that come from oligodendrocytes, for example, that may be very specific for multiple system atrophy. So I think this whole field is moving very rapidly in a, in a very exciting way. And so I think we're gonna find reliable diagnostic tests. And that's very important because when companies are coming to us talking about being interested in developing a new drug for MSA, one of the challenges is knowing whether you really have somebody with MSA that's going to get enrolled in the trial. And you want to enroll people at the very earliest stages when the diagnosis can be very difficult uh, to differentiate, from, for example, from Parkinson's disease. So I think these new studies, they're all still largely research. But I think these new studies will really change the way we do business, both with respect to diagnosis and then inclusion criteria into clinical trials. That's a great segue into question I had. Well, um, oh, go ahead. Someone wanted to. Is that Dr. I just Jordan? wanted. To, I can never resist the opportunity to throw in a quote from my old mentor Jack Griffin, who used to say of the lumbar puncture, "Oh, think of it as a watery CBC." Uh, you know, the CBC is a standard blood test, and lumbar punctures are really not as big a deal as people make of them. One of the things I've found in recent years is most of my female patients have had uh, uh, spinal anesthesia for childbirth, and they're like, well, it's a smaller needle, and it's in there for a short period of time, and they're like, oh, no, no big deal. So, uh, but that being said, uh, I have to definitely agree with uh, Dr. Lang that uh, I've been going around saying, I think within the next 10 years, somebody has any symptom that might be part of one of these degenerative diseases, not just the synucleinopathies, but probably also the tauopathy, will get a panel of te blood tests and will be able to say very precisely what kind of protein misfolding is going on. 
which may not correlate all that well with a clinical syndrome. And the clinical management is going to continue to follow its own uh, path. But in terms of trying to intervene in the aggregation and the access of misfolded proteins to other cells, um, you want to recognize what's going on and test in pure populations to develop these drugs. And when we've got the drugs, it's unlikely we'll come up with one that works equally well for every type of protein misfolding. So then the drugs will be targeted towards the underlying protein misfolding, whatever is going on clinically. I'd also so, add to uh, that, that I'd just <laughs> add to that, that remarkably, it may be that you can't just target the protein, you may have to target a certain strain of the protein. And so targeting alpha-synuclein may not be sufficient. We may have to learn how a particular type of alpha-synuclein misbehaves and target that aspect. So it's, uh, it's very complicated, but very promising with the way this field is moving. Uh, th this is a great segue into another question that I had written down. Most of you have not seen probably the research session, but given what we've been talking about here, I really encourage you to, to tune into that when it's on as well, because there are some interesting discussions in there about research on the different strains, the different types of misfolding of these proteins. But one of the sessions specifically, Dr. Alberto Espe says, we should be developing treatment modalities that maintain levels of healthy alpha-synuclein rather than focusing so, so much on reducing levels of abnormal proteins. So given the lack of progress so far in developing effective treatments, is there evidence to support this approach? I'm going to take that because I've discussed this extensively <laughs> with Dr. Espe, and uh, he strongly believes that uh, this is a mechanism of these neurodegenerative diseases, and he is in a very small minority. There may be some component of loss of the normal function, but we have to admit that you can drop the normal protein substantially in animals, for example, and see no consequences of that at all. And the evidence that these diseases relate to loss of normal function ignores a huge amount of literature that shows a toxic effect of these misfolded proteins. And uh, maybe it's a combination. I'm not denying there may be a component of the reduction but to ignore all of the rest of the literature and the excellent science that uh, provides a strong reason to believe that these misfolded proteins have toxic effects, I think ignores uh, uh, evidence that really uh, it's to our peril if we do that, in my mind. Any other comments on that? Um, so there were a couple other questions that came into the chat. There's a Scottish woman who can smell PD from waxy substance on skin. They're developing a chemical test in the UK for this. Any opinion on the prospects of this working as a diagnostic tool? Worth following up for sure. <laughs> but um, it will help to know more exactly what, uh, you know, the, there are all sorts of things where uh, people and uh, especially trained dogs can and determine a whole lot of biochemistry from just smell. Um, but until you know exactly ha how it's happening, uh, how useful it can be for developing a test is hard to say. We have about seven minutes left and I do wanna end on time so that we keep the program moving along. Um, there was another question. It was suggested that an alternative to raising the head of the bed, my husband could purchase a foam wedge. The highest edge is 10 inches so that my husband is sleeping with his head raised 30 degrees. Is this sufficient? Our bed has a wooden bed frame and it's too heavy for us to raise. I mean, well, usually, yeah. Go ahead. Oh. Well, I was gonna say it's uh, another form of folding the bed. Um, <laughs> Even if you have to get some husky people to come in or use some uh, scissors jack or something to raise up the head of the bed frame and put something really solid under the head of the bed, you'll be much better off than using the foam wedge. So. Dr. Complotti, do you want to say something about that? No, no, yes, that's 
but you know, we're human in the end and whatever you do, as long as you're not folding yourself too much in the middle, as uh, the other, my colleagues pointed out, would be okay. But anyways, the more it's not recommended to be higher than 20, 30 degrees. So that would be sufficient if the amount of elevation, the degree of elevation is the question here. Uh, so Dr. George, there, uh, a little bit of a technical question maybe. In your first set of graphs that looked at the, uh, the real-time quick, not all the patients showed evidence of aggregation, if I was understanding it correctly. Were there characteristics of these patients that the, distinguished them from others in the sample? For example, were they uh, more recently diagnosed or, um, or was I mis just misunderstanding your slides? Uh, well, there are several different aggregation studies shown in the early slides, and some of them are using uh, substrates and conditions to bring out particular types of misfolding being seeded and uh, resulting in growth. And there are slides there that show uh, uh, controls. The other thing is some of the slides are done using material from autopsy, particularly brain. So you know you're seeding with the type of protein that caused a particular disease. If you use a patient population, because there is a tendency to think that someone has Parkinson's disease that you later realize has, say, MSA or several of the other variants, you see that there are some patients who supposedly have the disease who do not uh, undergo the seeding and the RT quick amplification that you would expect for their diagnosis, but they might if you did it under other conditions intended to bring out, uh, say, MSA. So it sort of depends, and then there's a couple of different studies mixed in there on my slides. So uh, the point of the slides is to show that with people who actually have a particular type of disease, most of them will show a distinctive characteristic uh, seeding and propagation and RT quick of the misfolded protein. So another question that I have is that, um, you know, with MSA, it's affecting the myelin sheath. Uh, there's a lot of degeneration there. Most of the drugs that are talked about relate to drugs for Parkinson's disease. Are there drugs related to MS, for example, which also affects the myelin sheath that have been tested or tried in, in patients, particularly those with more advanced MSA? Well, I think the, the difference between MSA demyelination and MS demyelination, I think, is pretty substantial. The mechanisms of demyelination are very, very different in terms of the nature of the inflammatory process in multiple sclerosis. So all of the disease-modifying trials in MS, I, I don't think uh, would have a, a drug that we think would be uh, effective for, um, for multiple system atrophy. There is clearly loss of myelin and uh, abnormalities of the oligodendroglial cells, but I think the mechanism is, is distinctly different. But yeah, are, the, any efforts the, to regenerate the myelin sheath? Are there, there ways that that could be done that might, it wouldn't treat, it wouldn't cure the disease obviously, but it might treat some symptoms? There have been trials uh, with stem cells trying to uh, generate more myelin in MS patients, but I don't think it's been done in MSA. I don't think that would be a high priority in terms of the right. benefit. I was going to say the only MS drug that comes to mind uh, that might be worth looking at would be famperidine, which uh, affects potassium channels and enhances conduction in nerve fibers that have been demyelinated. So it doesn't matter how they became demyelinated. Uh, as far as I know, nobody's looked at that in uh, multiple system atrophy. And again, I'm not sure how big a benefit it would be. Right. So. Where are we with research on MSAC? Because right now we don't really have any drugs at all that can, can benefit patients with that, with that diagnosis. Um, we only have one minute left, so I don't know if anybody wants to try to answer I mean, that. You know, I mean, we tend to see MSA as a unified diagnosis that uh, affects, at least in the beginning, different parts of the brain and maybe 
at the end, the generation is more spread, may affect, you know, may, may give you most of the phenotypes to a different degree. And I think focusing in the P's and the C's and the orthostatic hypotension, that doesn't help us address the disease at its origin. And that's, that's where we should focus, you know? And that's why what Dr. Lang pointed out, finding ways to diagnose MSA early, which is the hardest thing sometimes, would be a good first step. And finding, you know, agreeing with what's the, the most important mechanism that uh, contributes to this degeneration would be two important steps to so intervene in early. <clears throat> important for the audience to remember the difference between disease modifying treatment and treatment for symptoms. And all the anti-Parkinson drugs, the uh, orthostatic hypotension drugs, all of the things we've generally talked about are for symptoms and they variably help as we've been discussing. What we need are treatments that change the progression of the underlying disease, the degeneration. And we don't have anything for MSAP or as MSAP, uh, C. We, do, we don't have anything for MSA. And it just happens that there are a lot of anti-Parkinson drugs that may help that dopamine side that we talked about. Unfortunately, like MSAC, there are a huge number of diseases with ataxia as the primary problem. And we have no good treatment to help that right. symptom exactly. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's very frustrating. So the MSAC group is uh, not alone in terms of its lack of benefit from symptomatic drugs. What we need to do is get a drug or drugs that change the course, so slow it down and lessen the progressive disability of all of them. All right, thank you. Well, we are one minute over time, so I wanna thank all of our speakers. Uh, presentations were, were fascinating, very informative, and if people have questions, you can continue to reach out to the, the organizers and we'll try to get to people's questions as we can. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Bye, bye everybody. Bye.